Next to these, Lazarpidium claims our notice, a very remarkable plant known to the Greeks by the name of Silphium and originally a native of the province of Cyrenaica. The juice of this plant is called Lazar, and it is greatly in vogue for medicinal as well as other purposes, being sold at the same rate as silver. For these many years past, however, it has not been found in Cyrenaica, as the farmers of the revenue who hold the lands there on lease have a notion that it is more profitable to depasture flocks of sheep upon them. Within the memory of the present generation, a single stock is all that has ever been found there, and that was sent as a curiosity to the Emperor Nero. For this long time past, there has been no other laws are imported into this country, but that produced in either Persis, Media, or Armenia, where it grows in considerable abundance, though much inferior to that of Cyrenaica. Ancient texts describe this plant as an aphrodisiac, a remedy for everything from tetanus to toothache, and a delicacy. It could do it all. It grew exclusively in what's now Libya and was prized around the Mediterranean world for its many useful properties. And by the end of the first century CE, it was gone. But surprisingly, we might know its endling, a single stock reported by Pliny the Elder in 77 CE as having been given to the Roman Emperor Nero. It was called Silphium or Silphian or Lazar, and it has the dubious honor of being the first extinction in recorded history. Or does it? because we don't actually know what plant Silphium was. And some researchers think it's still around. But is that really a possibility? Or is there just something about the loss of Silphium that we can't accept? Our search for Silphium starts with two written descriptions and a handful of images found on ancient coins. The first account comes from Theophrastus, sometimes called the father of botany. He wrote that Silphium was most abundant along the coast of what's today the Gulf of Sidra, near Benghazi in Libya, that it sprang up after a heavy rain, that its stock lasted only for a year, and that it couldn't be cultivated. It had to grow wild. He also described how it looked. The root of Silphium was thick and covered in black bark. Its stalk was like that of ferula, a group of plants we call giant fennel. Its leaf was celery-like, and it had a broad fruit. And the coins we found that were minted in the area generally look like that, though the depiction of the plant on them did vary some over time. The second written description comes from Pliny the Elder, a Roman writer and naturalist. Pliny's account draws a lot from Theophrastus and others, who he calls the most trustworthy among the Greek writers. What he adds is a mention of Silphium's possible extinction through overgrazing by sheep, but he also says that a much inferior version still grows in other places. Which would mean that Silphium wasn't extinct, it was just locally extirpated. But how do we know that the plants he was writing about were the same plant? What do we think Silphium actually was? Well, if we compare the ancient descriptions to modern plants, we're left with a small number of possibilities. There's Thapsia garganica, sometimes called deadly carrot. It's a good match for the description of Silphium, including having fruits that look like the ones on some of those coins. It grows in northeastern Libya and is difficult to cultivate, like Silphium was said to be. There's also at least three species of those giant fennels we mentioned earlier. One is Ferula tingitana. It grows in the right area, and the plants in this genus look similar enough to the real Silphium for a Theophrastus to have recognized the resemblance. But it's toxic to humans and animals, and its fruit doesn't match the depictions on the ancient coins. Another is Ferula drudiana, which was recently suggested by a researcher to be the actual Silphium, still growing wild and definitely not extinct. But it doesn't grow in Libya. It was found in the Anatolia region of Turkey in three locations associated with formerly Greek villages. The researcher proposed that its seeds were smuggled there in antiquity, allowing it to survive the extinction of the rest of its species in Libya. If this plant really is Silphium, then Pliny was talking about at least two different plants when he mentioned a much inferior version of Silphium growing elsewhere, since it's unlikely he knew about this particular ferula. And one of those much inferior versions was probably a third ferula species that has been put forward as a potential candidate for Silphium's identity, Asafetida. Which is confusing, because Asafetida can refer to both a specific species of ferula, Ferula asafetida, and the substance produced by the roots of a number of species of ferula, and it's also sometimes used as a common name for those other species. 
These grow in various parts of North Africa and Central Asia, particularly Iran and Afghanistan. And you might be familiar with the use of asafoetida as a pungent element in Indian cuisine. The final possible options for the real identity of Silphium are that it was either a hybrid of two kinds of plants, or that whatever plant it was has since lost the culinary and medicinal properties that made it desirable. We may never know exactly what Silphium was, unless some is recovered from ancient shipwrecks, for example. Which could happen, enough ships certainly sank in the Mediterranean. But it seems pretty likely that it did really disappear in ancient times. It was such a hot trade commodity that it would have kept being exported otherwise. So what happened to it? Well, the leading hypothesis for decades has been us. Silphium was just so popular in the Greek and Roman world that it was harvested out of existence. And this would have been possible because, like its probable relatives in the genus Ferula, it might have had specific temperature and moisture requirements for germination, and grown very slowly. But a paper published in 2022 suggests a different cause for its extinction — environmental changes. We're not off the hook, though, because they still might have been our fault. The researchers point to two lines of evidence to support their hypothesis — ancient written accounts, again, and modern paleoecological studies. Both suggest the same thing — that major land use changes happened in the small region where Silphium grew after Greek colonization, and continued into Roman times. Forests were cut down for timber for roofing and export, and farming expanded, which can be seen in sediment samples as a shift in the kinds of pollen that were present. Before, wild plants native to the area dominated — things like pine, oak, and juniper, along with shrubs like buckthorn. After, pollen from cereal grains and olives — human food crops — appear in the samples. And as ever more land was cleared for farming and grazing to support the growing population of ancient Cyrene, less rain fell, temperatures went up, and the soil became less productive and eroded away. Today, we call this process desertification, and it seems that Silphium couldn't survive these changes to the local climate. Which would make it not just the first recorded extinction, but the first one caused by human impacts on climate, too, well before the concept of extinction was even named. Because before the late 1700s, it was mostly thought that living things simply could not go extinct. Plato and Aristotle viewed nature and humanity's place in it as hierarchical with everything created for a purpose — to serve people. And Aristotle's view on the creation of life was that it was spontaneous and continuous. And while humans could affect local conditions, nature was the product of forces greater than us, making extinction impossible. Later worldviews shaped by Christian theology agreed. A supreme creator wouldn't create an organism and let it go extinct. That would disrupt the divine hierarchy. Georges Cuvier, a French naturalist, is widely credited with basically coming up with the idea of extinction in 1796. He compared the bones of living elephants to those of fossil mammoths, and argued that animals of that size couldn't just be hiding somewhere, so they must not be alive anymore. This was even part of Thomas Jefferson's reasoning behind the Lewis and Clark expedition around the same time. There was a lot of North America that hadn't been explored by colonists, so Maybe mammoths were still out there somewhere. Which sounds kind of familiar. Now, of course, we know that extinction can and does happen all the time. And mammoths are not still out there. And we have continued to record extinctions as notable events, as Pliny did. Which makes me wonder if the recognition of the loss of Silphium meant something to him. To ancient Cyrene, Silphium's disappearance meant the loss of a lucrative export. But to us, now, even at a distance, it potentially means more. It's a loss on multiple levels. It's a loss of human knowledge. We can't know what plant it really was, and if it had any or all of the uses it supposedly did — culinary, medicinal, and otherwise. It's also a loss to its ecosystem. Whatever function it provided is now gone. And it's a loss of biodiversity. Whatever was encoded in its genes is out of our reach. And maybe it's this loss of information by way of extinction that we can't get over. That we once knew this thing, and now we may never again. Endlings is filmed in the Harry Plumley studio and was made possible by hundreds of you who supported us on Kickstarter. Thank you so very much. We really could not have done this without you.